all right, so we're going to look at books seven and eight today, uh, which normally would be skipped over entirely in uh, Studies in Paradise Lost, because it is now getting into things that are less central to the, uh, th the central themes of Paradise Lost, which are man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree, which brought death into our world and all our woe with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us. So those things are the central features. But because it's an epic, um, and uh, it is encyclopedic in its scope, and Milton wants to emphasize the theme that he has already announced from the very time uh, at the beginning of the course when we looked at the Nativity Ode, that there are, there's a cosmological significance to Christ, and it will include all manner of knowledge. Uh, he's going to include in that assessment or in that depiction of the comprehensive way in which his epic will depict this, a discussion of the heavens, or in this case, astronomy. And so that's what happens in book seven and eight, is a discussion of uh, that subject matter of astronomy. Now, this is not something that contemporary, uh, our, our, our age takes much interest in at all. It's a very, uh, it's still a science. It's studied uh, with terrific seriousness by some, but it's not, uh, it's not actually much uh, observed by the rest of us, unless we're into astrology, uh, which increasing numbers of people are, I guess. <coughs> um, I could, I'll say something about that in a minute, I guess. But the astronomy is one of the four um, elements of the quadrivium. And so it is associated with a type of understanding of reality that's mediated through the number. Arithmetic is obviously related to numbers, as, as we know. I don't even need to talk about that. But so is music. Music is also very mathematically precise. And by the time that Milton writes this, uh, music has become very rich indeed. As I say, uh, I said when we looked at the Nativity Ode, largely based on Boethius's studies of music, his uh, tractate on music, uh, modern Western music was understood in accordance with that. And there were different types of music once again. There was a, uh, the music of the spheres, the music of Mundana, and then there was the instrumental music, and then there was the human music. And the mu human music was, again, that part of us that takes delight in music, which we, we all appreciate and recognize. Uh, and we not only recognize it, we also associate it with something very profound and, and, and true to that matter. It's not just beautiful. And we will also say that it's good, it makes us feel good, but we will also say that there's something profoundly true about it and worth fighting over. So people, when they get arguments over music, it's not merely the way we see music in our day that it's a matter of personal taste but something more is at stake. And that's why you fight over it. Uh, when Milton articulates this study of astronomy, he is connecting that with all manner of other uh, elements of the quadrivium. The quadriv quadrivium is, again, one of the, uh, the f uh, components related to the seven liberal arts. Mil Milton's writing in, in words here, but again, the music of his prose or his poetry is important to him. And he's trying to connect all of these discrete areas or these different ways of knowledge. That's what a vium is. There's a four ways in relation to number and three ways in relation to words. But he's gonna fuse all of them. And so it's a comprehensive, and of course, Milton's understanding that is theology is the queen of the sciences. And the sciences here are, again, those seven liberal arts. So we, we, in our day, we separate the arts from the sciences, and we even see them as opposed to one another, which I think is entirely unfortunate and is one of the uh, reasons why we no longer have universities, but rather have multiversities. And there's, uh, they're marked by diversity, but not by unity. There's nothing that unifies the various subjects. Uh, it ought to be different in a Christian university. 
because what unites them all is Christ. In him all things hold together. So Colossians 1.15 and company. He's above all things, uh, in all, him all things hold together. Uh, and he is also the, the, the goal of all things. He's there, the, the origin of all things. He was the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But also, all things will point towards him, and that includes all of the created order, and that's why, again, theology is the queen of the sciences. And the other sciences, then, are her subjects. So language will serve uh, that purpose when it's rightly understood. It will be used to bless people and not curse them and so forth. Likewise, what we now call the sciences related to the natural world should have that overarching purpose of giving us a holistic understanding of what knowledge is. And Milton's expressing that here in his uh, seventh book, where Raphael is still uh, answering Adam's inquiry about things. Remember last time we left off with the war in heaven? And uh, him telling by means of analogy what about spiritual things in physical terms. Adam, you're a man of, of earth, so I will present it to you in the terms of a man of earth. There are you know, bodies and battles and cannons and so forth, but really it's a spiritual battle. But of course, I, ha I can't convey that to you in just those terms. I have to convey, I have to clothe it in language that is appropriate to space and time and those are the conditions under which you live. And so I'll explain it to you in that way. So it's a three-day fight. Is it really three days? Who knows? It's accommodation. We, we understand things in terms of temporal succession because we're finite creatures. This is not a product of the fall. Mortality is the product of the fall. As we die, finitude is not. We are not infinite beings. We have a spiritual nature, yes. But we are not infinite in our perspective. We're not capable of that. So it's accommodating to that. Now, the discussion then moves on to how and wherefore the world was, was first created, which is going to be an interesting subject. It's not central to Milton's theme, but it is something that we all want to know. And, um, and so he will get into that. And the reason why God does create because one of uh, Satan's slanderous allegations is that God lost a number of worshipers, so he's going to fill them up. He's going to replace them. So God is responding to his initiative, as it were. And it always puts God on the defensive and also God, uh, Satan in the driver's seat. I'm the one who's making things happen. He's having to react. And, and this, uh, by presenting this, it makes it clear that it's quite the contrary. So the, book seven, we'll talk about the creation uh, and why it happens and, and, and in what way it happens. And then he will move on to the heavens and that'll be in book eight. And with that, he will need to invoke the muse of, of astronomy, which is Urania. And you'll see that noted here. So this is one of the three or one of the four rather invocations of a muse. And the muse here is that of Urania, uh, traditionally associated with astronomy. He hasn't actually got to astronomy yet. He'll get to that in book eight. But seven and eight are a, uh, a unit, if you will. So it begins with that sort of invocation. Let me read from it. Descend from heaven, Urania, by that name, if rightly thou art called. So note again, Milton is using the traditional uh, muse. Remember, the muses are the go goddesses of memory. And that particular branch of knowledge related to the heavens, we, the Greeks called her Urania, Urania. Milton is not going to quibble over that. But that particular branch of knowledge related to that particular muse, I'll call you that. Whose voice divine following above the Olympian hill I soar. Again, he again echoing what he said in book one. He's going way, way above the Aeonian Mount but it's still using the terms that he has inherited. Above the me flight of Pegasian wing, the meaning, not the name I call. For thou nor of the muses nine, nor on the top of old Olympus dwellst, nor, but heavenly born before the hills appeared, 
or, or fountain flowed. Thou with eternal wisdom didst converse. Wisdom, thy sister, and with her didst play in presence of the Almighty Father, pleased with thy celestial song. Up, led by thee into the heaven of heavens, I have presumed an earthly guest and drawn imperial air, thy tempering. With like safety girded down, return me to my native element, lest from this flying steed unreined at once Belaref, Belaref, Belarophon, gosh, though from a lower climb dismounted on the Elean field I fall erroneous, there to wander and forlorn. Half yet remains unsung. It's halfway through the epic, it's book seven. Half yet remains unsung, but narrower bound within the visible diurnal sphere. Because now he's going to not be going back into hell and he's not going to be dealing with the heavens per se. It's going to be sticking more in the, uh, uh, the uh, in terra firma. Standing on earth, not wrapped above the pole. More safe I sing with mortal voice, unchanged to horse or mute, though fallen on evil days. On evil days, though fallen, and evil tongues, in darkness and with dangers compassed round, and solitude, yet not alone, while thou visits my slumbers nightly, or when morn purples the east, still govern thou my song, Urania, and fit audience find though few. Uh, Wordsworth will echo these words in uh, his um, preface to the excursion. Uh, and again, uh, Wordsworth, like so many of the great poets that, that succeeded Milton, will have read Milton's uh, Paradise Lost and his other poetry very carefully, will echo not only their subject matter, but their very terms. Uh, some of the phrases sometimes references. So again, uh, when we're studying Milton, we have to understand that he is in relation with a tradition of literature which he is echoing and he is being echoed by subsequent poets. And this is a right way to understand human nature. We don't just live among other humans in our generation uh, uh, in accordance with our identification with them because we can parse it down to a still smaller subset that we call our identity group, but we live in, uh, with a common human nature with Jesus and everybody who ever walked the earth as, as a human being. And they are still, in, in a sense, our companions. Insofar as we read their works, uh, learn about them, celebrate their victories, and um, lament their failings. But we learn from it. And so we don't, we, don't, we don't have to just draw upon the current generation of people to uh, get wisdom. So we're getting wisdom from that. And that is exactly what Milton is trying to do. But note that in his day, as much as I've praised the Renaissance and the Reformation age, look, I mean, look at this font of wisdom. He says that there's, a fit, there's very few of his contemporaries, a fit audience though few, and hostility to what he wants to say even. Extraordinary. I would say, from my naive point of view, that Milton's age in order to have a man like Milton must be rather extraordinary. He seems to see rather the opposite. He repeatedly speaks of this. He'll do it in book nine as well. Talk about the, the dark days and the, and the cold climate, etc. But anyway, he, he concludes there in line 31 and then makes a shift. But drive afar off the barbarous dissonance of Bacchus and his revelers. The race of that wild rout that tore the Thracian bard of Rodope, where woods and rocks had ears to rapture, till the savage clamor drowned both harp and voice. Nor could the muse defend her son. So fail not thou, who thee implores, for thou art heavenly, she an empty dream. So again, Bacchus is the, is the wine god, but also the god of poetry, beloved of the muse. And yet there Bacchus was torn apart by a wild and uh, dissolute crowd, famously. Uh, and uh, Milton is threatened with the same. And he 
on the other hand, worship a false god, I worship the one true god. So therefore, uh, Milton pleads, fail me not. So again, is an engagement with the past, but it's also a critique of the past. Uh, it's, when he engages with it, he's clearly showing that there's a note of dissent, but it's not total dissent in the sense that I'm going to ignore it altogether. I have nothing to learn from it. He thinks there's some truth there, uh, even in the uh, rites and passages of ancient uh, pagan practices. So back then on, say, goddess, what ensued when Raphael, the affable archangel, had forewarned Adam by dire example to beware apostasy by what befell in heaven to those apostates, lest the like befall in paradise to Adam or his race. Charged not to touch uh, the interdicted tree, if they transgress and slight that sole command so easily obeyed amid the choice of all tastes else to please their appetite, though wandering. He, with his consorted Eve, the story heard attentive and was filled with admiration and deep muse to hear of things so high and strange, things to their thought so unimaginable as hate in heaven and war so near the peace of God in bliss with such confusion. But the evil soon driven back, redounded as a flood on those from whom it sprung, impossible to mix with blessedness. Whence Adam soon repealed uh, the doubts that in his heart arose, and now led on, yet sinless, with desire to know what nearer might concern him, how this world of heaven and earth conspicuous first began, when and whereof created, for what cause, what within Eden or without was done before his memory, as one who whose drought yet scarce allayed still eyes the current stream, whose liquid murmur heard new thirst excites, proceeded thus to ask his heavenly guest. He desires to know, and that it's not withheld from him. Remember, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is exactly that. It's not the tree of knowledge. Adam has all knowledge open to him. It's not wrong for him to want to know. But the knowledge of good and evil is what is forbidden. So there's something about that. It's the moral. You must not plumb the moral uh, depths on both sides. Therein you will be compromised. At any rate, the angel, gu angel guest is asked about the creation of the earth. Great things and full of wonder in our ears, far differing from this world. Thou hast revealed, divine interpreter, by favor sent down from the Empyrean to forewarn us timely of what might else have been our loss, unknown which human knowledge could not reach, for which to the infinitely good we owe immortal thanks, and his admonishment received with solemn purpose to observe immutably his sovereign will, the end of what we are. But since thou hast vouchsafed gently for our instruction to impart things above earthly thought, which yet concerned our knowing, as to highest wisdom seemed, deign to descend now lower and relate what may no less perhaps avail us known. How first began this heaven which we behold distant so high, with moving fires adorned innumerable, and this which yields or fills all space, the ambient air wide interfused embracing round this florid earth. What cause moved our, moved the creator in his holy rest through all eternity, so late, to build in chaos, and the work begun, how soon absolved. If unforbid, thou mayest be unfold what we, not to explore the secrets, ask of his eternal empire, but the more to magnify his works, the more we know. So note the uh, m motivation for the question even, to give him greater praise. Knowledge is to be sought not as an end in itself, which is the way the academy presents it, in its best iteration. Um, so it, it's, but with a, with a clear motivation, and the motivation of learning then is to give glory to God and magnify his works. 
Note that. Very interesting. Uh, in the uh, secular academy of the 18th century, the 19th century, and even into the 20th century, the ideal was neutrality. Unmotivated, just for the purpose of the discovery of the truth, as if the truth could be known without its, uh, uh, without its purpose being considered or the end of learning. Uh, that's not a Christian view of knowledge. And once it was unmoored from God's purposes, then it, it then became uh, twisted so that it then did serve a purpose. And the purpose is that of, are that of humans then. And it can be used in multiple ways. But at any rate, Adam's intention is to magnify God's works. And the great light of day yet wants to run. Much of his race, though steep, suspense in heaven held by thy voice. Thy potent voice he hears, and longer will delay to hear thee tell his generation, and the rising birth of nature from the unapparent deep. Or if the star of morning and the moon haste to thy audience, night with her will bring silence, and deep and sleep listening to thee will watch. Or we can bid his absence till thy song end, and dismiss thee ere the morning shine. Now there's something of a suggestion here uh, that the, uh, the heavens themselves will um, obey their call here in terms of we can make the heavens act in accordance with our will on this and, and we can wait or we can do it by night, whatever. Thus Adam, his illustrious guest, besought. And thus the godlike an angel answered mild. One of Milton's favorite words, mild. This also thy request with caution asked, obtain. Though to recount almighty works, what works, what words or tongue of seraph can suffice, or heart of man suffice to comprehend? Yet what thou canst attain, which best may serve to glorify the maker, and infer thee also happier, shall not be withheld thy hearing. Such commission from above I have received to answer thy desire of knowledge within bounds. Beyond, abstain to ask, nor let thine own inventions hope things not revealed, which the invisible king, only omniscient, hath suppressed in night, to none communicable in earth or heaven. Enough is left besides to search and know. But knowledge is as food and needs no less her temperance over appetite. To know in measure what the mind may well contain, oppresses else with surfeit, uh, uh, with too much, and soon turns wisdom to folly as nourishment to wind. So the, the, the wise uh, speaker in Ecclesiastes says that it's vanity. Knowledge is sorrow, too much knowledge is uh, just the means of, uh, as I say, sorrow, and is, seems vain and, and folly to his ears, as much as he seeketh af after wisdom. So again, a great deal of here, uh, here, though it seems rather off topic with Milton's grand theme, is, is directing us in how we ought to regard our own learning, and the motivation for it, the limitations upon it, and even he refers to inventions, that is, the, but he doesn't mean inventions in the sense of a discovery of, a, of an implement, like a, a, a cell phone or a camera or whatever. He means a discovery of something that's hidden that we can find is revealed through inquiry. Nothing wrong with that, but there's a limit to that, however, and there ought to be a limitation to that, and again, this will guide uh, a proper understanding of the field of education and of knowledge. Anyway, again, important for an epic, Milton is again directing his readership in, in all areas of life. That's what the epic's meant to do, and Milton uh, certainly does that here. So know then, says the angel, that after Lucifer from heaven, so call him, brighter once amidst the host of angels than that star the stars among, fell with his flaming legions through the deep into his place. And the great son returned victorious with his saints. The omnipotent eternal father from his throne beheld their multitude and to his son thus spake. At least our envious foe hath failed, who thought all alike 
himself rebellious, by whose aid this inaccessible high strength, the seat of deity supreme, us dispossessed. He trusted to have seized, and into fraud drew many, whom their place knows here no more. Yet far the greater part have kept, I see, their station. Heaven yet populous retains number sufficient to possess her realms, though wide, and this high temple to frequent with ministries due and solemn rites. But lest his heart exalt him in the harm already done to have dispeopled heaven, my damage fondly deemed, I can repair that detriment if such it be to lose self lost, and in a moment will create another world out of one man, a race of men innumerable, there to dwell, not here, till by degrees of merit raised, they open to themselves at length the way up hither, under long obedience tried, and earth be changed to heaven, and heaven to earth, one kingdom joy and union without end. Meanwhile, inhabit lax, ye powers of heaven, and thou my word, begotten son, by thee this I perform. Speak thou and be it done. So note this, and this is very interesting. Um, mankind in God's, this is Milton's understanding of it, that in the beginning, when God creates mankind, the purpose of mankind is through its long obedience to become more like God. More divine, more heavenly. The purpose of God, and, these, and Milton will regard this as, the, uh, as a decree that goes without uh, repeal. That the purpose of human life is to become more godly, to become more heavenly, to, through, and, but through obedience. Now here in the beginning, there's not yet the first disobedience, but even after the disobedience happens, it still will transpire through, dis through obedience. So this is the purpose of Christian education. It's to make brighter and better and more beautiful uh, human beings that exalt God's holy name. So Milton's making a commentary on this. And again, it is in fitting with what he said with, uh, in, uh, of Christian education. It's to repair the ruins of our first parents by knowing to go up, uh, by uh, knowing God or right. And then to follow in the mandate they were given. That was interesting. Spilled the coffee. Never mind. Um, so be it done. Okay, so the father then charges the son to create. So spake the Almighty. Oh, no, be it done. And then says, my overshadowing spirit and might with thee I send along. So all three of the uh, persons of the Trinity are involved in creation. The spirit and the father's might accompany the son, but the son, uh, Milton's following Christian theology, uh, is the creator of the world, just like it says in John's gospel, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, by him were all things created. Right, the word, the, the second person of the Trinity. By thee this I perform, speak thou, and be it done, my overshadowing spirit and might with thee I send along. Ride forth and bid the deep within appointed bounds be heaven and earth. Boundless the deep, because I am who fill infinitude, nor vacuous the space, though I uncircumscribed myself retire and put not forth my goodness, which is free to act or not, necessity and chance approach not me, and what I will is fate. So he's speaking to the polytheism, polytheism of, the, of the ancient world, in which the fates were above the divinities. They were, and they, they bound even the Olympian gods. And God, God's will is what they call fate. What God wills happens. But it's not to be understood in a way that denies free will because God remains free. Remember, so in terms of theology, God has being, but his being is uncreated being. He exists eternally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
in a relationship of love before any of the created order was created, the heavens and the earth, which of which we hear in Genesis 1, verse 1, uh, that is a different, that's contingent being, that's created being. It does not shackle God's freedom or his, his uh, presence even. He's retired from that. So what Milton says here is, is very important because when the, when the created order falls along with Adam, God himself is not implicated in the fall. He's still free to, to act without an, an, any impediment upon himself. So what we see as a necessity, the laws of nature, um, are not against God's nature, of course, but God is also not bound by them. So he can't perform miracles. Right? So important, again, it's a theological point, but it, uh, it's an important one. So spake the Almighty, and to what he spake, his word, the filial Godhead, gave effect. Immediate are the acts of God. More swift than time or motion can, can receive. Uh, than time or motion, but to human ears cannot without process of speech be told. Sorry. So told as earthly motion can receive, great triumph and rejoicing was in heaven. When such was heard, declared the Almighty's will. Glory they sung to the Most High. Good will to future men, and in their dwellings, peace. Glory to him whose just avenging ire had driven out the ungodly from his sight and the habitations of the just. To him, glory and praise whose wisdom had ordained good out of evil to create. Instead of spirits, malign a better race to bring into their vacant room and thence diffuse his good to worlds and ages infinite so sang the hierarchies meanwhile the sun on his great expedition now appeared girt with omnipotence with radiance crowned of majesty divine sapience and love immense and all his father in him shone about his chariot numberless were poured cherub and seraph, potentates and thrones and virtues, winged spirits and chariots winged from the armory of God, where stand of old myriads between two brazen mountains lodged against a solemn day. Harnessed at hand, celestial equipage, and now come forth spontaneous, for within them spirit lived. Attendant on their Lord, heaven opened wide forever during gates, harmonious sound on golden hinges moving to let forth the king of glory in his powerful word and spirit coming to create new worlds. On heavenly ground they stood and from the shore they viewed the vast immeasurable abyss, outrageous as a sea, dark, wasteful, wild, up from the bottom turned by furious winds and surging waves as mountains to assault heaven's height and with the center mix the pole. Silence, ye troubled waves, and thou deep peace, said then the omnific word, your discord end. Nor stayed, but on the wings of cherubim uplifted in paternal glory rode far into chaos and the world unborn, for chaos heard his voice. Him all his train followed in bright procession to behold creation and the wonders of his might. Then stayed the fervid wheels, and in his hand he took the golden compasses prepared in God's eternal store to circumscribe this universe and all created things. One foot he centered. So now he's thinking of it like a pair of compasses sticks one foot in and spins it around and the other turned round through the vast profundity obscure and said thus far extend thus far thy bounds this be thy just circumference O world thus God the heaven created thus the earth matter unformed and void Darkness profound covered the abyss, but on the watery calm his brooding wings the Spirit of God outspread, and vital virtue infused, and vital warmth through the fluid mass, but downward purged the dark, the black 
tartarous, cold, infernal dregs adverse to life. Then found it, then conglobed like things to like, the rest to several place, disparted, and between spun out the air, and earth, self-balanced on her center, hung. Let there be light, said God, and forth with light, ethereal first of things, quintessence pure sprung from the deep and from her native east to journey through the airy gloom began, sphered in a radiant cloud, for yet the sun was not. She in a cloudy tabernacle sojourned the while. This is interesting. So light exists before the sun. Just as it says in scripture, Milton is following this. Light is not a product of the sun. The sun rather is a uh, reflection of the light that already exists. First thing that exists is light. So when, when Jesus is the light of the world and we can make an analogy between the sun and light, which Milton's already made in book three of Paradise Lost, given an analogy there, and remember this is the one form of wisdom. It comes through the eye. He can't see. He can feel the warmth. Nonetheless, this is just a picture of what the true light is. Remember in the book of Revelation, where there will be no more sun but the light will be there in their presence. Again, reference to a light of which the sun's light is a pale um, reflection. And we can't even look at the sun directly. Let there be light. Uh, Sphere in a radiant cloud, for yet the sun was not. She in a cloudy tabernacle soldier in the wild. God saw the light was good and light from darkness by the hemisphere divided. Light the day and darkness night, he named. Thus was the first day even and morn, nor passed uncelebrated, nor unsung by the celestial choirs when orient light exhaling first from darkness they beheld. Birthday of heaven and earth. What a way to put it. With joy and shout, the hollow universal orb they filled and touched their golden harps, and hymning praised God in his works. Creator him they sung, both when first evening was and when first morn. Again, God said, let there be firmament amid the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, expanse of liquid, pure, transparent, elemental air, diffused in circuit to the out uttermost convex of this great round partition firm and sure the waters underneath from those above dividing for as earth so he the world built on circumfluous waters calm in wide crystalline ocean and the loud misrule of chaos far removed lest fierce extremes contiguous might distemper the whole frame, and heaven he named the firmament. So even and morning chorus sung the second day. Notice the, the first, uh, we'll note this throughout. When God speaks, order is brought about. Limitation, a circumscribed reality, it's called good. God's nature is, in it, is, is obviously good, but it's also connected with order. And chaos is the dissolution of order. So again, all philosophies, theologies, uh, political practices that are anarch anarchic in their uh, nature are far from God. Uh, Milton is with the Republican forces that oppose the king's rule, not because it is rule, not because there is hierarchy, but rather because it's unjust. He doesn't oppose hierarchy for the sake of opposing all hierarchy or order for the sake of disorder. He's not like a French revolutionary. It's because it's a false, pretentious order, one that is immoral in its conduct. That's the, that's the rationale. And it flows out of his theology here. Again, Charles I would have claimed the divine right of kings and thereby made himself God, however, under no law, no authority uh, besides himself. Uh, Milton and his uh, contemporary says, you have no such right. It was never given to you. You cannot claim it. Um, at any rate, the earth was formed, but in the womb as yet of waters. 
embryon, immature involved, appeared not over all the face of earth, main ocean flowed, not idle, but with warm, prolific humor softening all her globe, fermented the great mother to conceive, satiate with genial moisture, when God said, be gathered now, ye waters under heaven, into one place, and let dry land appear. So note that the firmament mentioned in book two is not the earth, it's the heaven. That's what's firm. Between the waters. Well, now we have the earth, which we associate with the firmament because it's firm, but the heaven is, more, is the first firmament created. The heavens and the earth, well, there was the heaven, now we'll get to the earth. And the dry land appears, and immediately the mountains huge appear emergent, and their broad back, bare backs upheave into the clouds, their tops ascend the sky, so high as heave the tumid hills. So low down sunk a hollow bottom, broad and deep, capacious bed of waters. Thither they hasted with glad precipitants, unrolled as drops on dust, conglobing from the dry. Part rise in crystal wall or ridge direct for haste, such flight the great command impressed on the swift floods as, as armies at the call of trumpet, for of armies thou hast heard, troop to their standard, so the watery throng, wave rolling after wave, where, the, where way they found, if steep with torrent rapture, if through plain, soft ebbing, nor withstood them rock or hill, but they, or underground or circuit wide with serpent error wandering, found their way, and on the washy ooze deep channels war. So now we get rivers. Easy, ere God hath bid the ground be dry, all but within those banks, where rivers now stream and perpetual draw their humid train. The dry earth, the dry land, earth, and the great receptacle of congregated waters, he called seas, and saw that it was good, and said, let the earth put forth the verdant grass. Uh, herb yielding seed, and fruit tree yielding fruit after her kind, whose seed is in herself upon the earth. He scarce had said when the bare earth till then, desert and bare, unsightly, unadorned, brought forth, forth the tender grass, whose verdure clad her universal face with pleasant green. Then herbs of every leaf that sudden flowered upon their various colors and made gay her bosom smelling sweet. And these, scarce blown, forth issued thick the clustering vine, forth crept the swelling gourd up stood the corny reed embattled in her field and the humble shrub and bush with frizzled hair implicit, last rose as in a dance the stately trees and spread their branches hung with copious fruit or gemmed their blossoms. With high woods the hills were crowned with tufts and each fountain side with borders along the rivers. That earth now seemed like to heaven a seat where gods might dwell or wander with delight and love to haunt her sacred shades, though God had not yet reigned upon the earth and man to till the ground none was. But from the earth, a dewy mist went up and watered all the ground and each plant of the field, which ere it was in the earth God made and every herb before it grew on the green stem. God saw that it was good for even in morn recorded the third day. Okay, so then he will make uh, on the fourth day the lights of the heavens, the greater and the lesser, the sun and the moon, uh, and the stars crown the fourth day. Uh, on the fifth day, line 385, sorry, I'd love to read it, but for lack of time, uh, we will get the creation of reptiles from the waters uh, and the birds of the air and the creatures of the sea. Uh, the fish, and we'll come to the sixth day. The sixth, and of creation last arose with evening harps and matin, when God said, let the earth bring forth soul living in her kind, cattle and creeping things, and beast of the earth, 
each in their kind. The earth obeyed, and straight opening her fertile womb, teemed at a birth in numerous living creatures. Perfect forms, limbed and full grown. Note that they didn't come in a, uh, a, as baby animals. They're full grown adult animals in their first iteration. Out of the ground up rose, as from his lair, the wild beast where he wands, he wands in forest wild, in thicket, brake, or den, among the trees in pairs they rose. They walked. The cattle in the fields and meadows green. Note at first there's only two of each. Uh, whose rare and solitary these in flocks, pasturing at once, and in broad herds upsprung. So they came in herbs, herds. The grassy clods now calved, now half appeared the tawny lion, pawing to get free his hinder parts. Then springs is broke from bounds, so he's literally coming up from the earth. And he's stuck by the earth and he pops out of the earth. The rampant shakes his brinded mane, the ounce, the leopard and the tiger as the mole rising out of the earth, the crumbled earth above them threw in hillocks, the swift stag from underground bore up his branching head, scarce from his mold behemoth, behemoth biggest born of earth upheaved, his vastness. Uh, behemoth, um, some think it's an elephant, and that's probably Milton's choice here. Um, Fleeced the flocks and bleating rose as plants ambiguous between sea and land, the river horse, the hippopotamus. That's what uh, hippopotamus means, by the way. Uh, hippo is the, uh, the Greek word for horse. Potamus is river. So the, the river horse and scaly crocodile. At once came forth whatever creeps the ground, insect or worm. Those waved their limber fans for wings and smallest lineaments exact in all their liveries, decked of summer's pride with spots of gold and purple, azure and green. These as a line their long dimension drew, streaking the ground with sinuous trays. Not all min minims of nature, some of serpent kind, wondrous in length and copulence involved, their snaky folds, and added wings. First crept the parsimonious Emmet, provident of future, in small room, large um, heart enclosed, pattern of just equality, perhaps, there hereafter joined in her popular tribes of commonality. Swarming next appeared the female bee that feeds her husband drone deliciously and builds her waxen cells with honey stored. The rest are numberless. And thou their natures knowest, and gave them names, needless to thee repeated, nor unknown the serpent, subtlest beast of all the field, of huge extent sometimes, with brazen eyes and hairy mane terrific. Note that the serpent in the Garden of Eden has, a, has hair. Uh, Though to thee not noxious, but obedient at thy call. Now, Heaven in all her glory shone and rolled her motions as the great first mover's hand first wheeled their course. Earth in her rich attire, consummate, lovely smiled. Air, water, earth by fowl, fish, beast was flown, was swum, was walked, frequent. And of the sixth day yet remained. There wanted yet the master work. The end of all yet done, a creature who not prone and brute as other creatures, but endued with sanctity of reason, might erect his stature and upright with front serene govern the rest, self-knowing and from thence magnanimous to correspond with heaven, but grateful to acknowledge whence his good descends, thither with heart and voice and eyes directed in devotion to adore and worship God supreme, who made him chief of all his works. Therefore the omnipotent eternal father, for where is not he present? Thus to his son audibly spake. So here's the creation of, of Adam and note the description of Adam in his nature. What is his nature? 
Well, he's not prone as the others. He stands upright on two feet, erect. And he is, uh, has a, endued with the sanctity of reason. He's capable of thinking in abstraction. He's capable of thinking from a different perspective. He's not limited, limited by his body and his thoughts. He can imagine other realities. He can think about things in their uh, invisible attributes. So he can understand in accordance with numbers, numbers which we cannot see. And he can make abstractions based on that. He can understand geometry, which he can measure, but he, al he can also understand music, which he can, he he can hear, but he understands them in accordance with arithmetic. Likewise, astronomy. So there's a connection there, which man alone can understand because he, because he has this sanctity of reason. Very important. And note that he's an individual. There's no herd here. He's not part of a group. Very important. Uh, theologically, Milton may not even realize how important it is, how it becomes, because again, in Darwinian thought, um, man becomes a group animal, part of the race of a, of a kind, humankind. In a sense, he is a kind because they're all kinds, but he's distinct from the others. They're totally different. And, uh, and directed to govern the rest of creation, but also to adore and worship God. So further is said on this, let us now make man in our image, man in our similitude, and let them rule over the fish and fowl of, of sea and air, beast of the field and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps the ground. This said, he formed thee, Adam, thee, O man, dust of the ground, and in thy nostrils breathed the breath of life. In his own image he created thee, in the image of God, express, and thou becamest a living soul. Male, he created thee, but thy consort, female for race, then blessed mankind and said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, subdue it, and throughout dominion hold over fish of the sea and fowl of the air and every living thing that moves on the earth, wherever thus created, for no place is yet distinct by name. Thence, as thou knowest, he brought thee into this delicious grove, this garden, planted with the trees of God, delectable both to behold and taste, and freely all their pleasant fruit for food gave thee. All sorts are here, that all the earth yields, variety without end. But of the tree which tasted works, knowledge of good and evil, thou mayest not. In the day thou eatest, thou diest. Death is the penalty imposed, beware. And govern well thy appetite, lest sin surprise thee, and her black attendant death. Here finished thee, and all that he had, he had made viewed, and behold, all was entirely good. So even in morning accomplished the sixth day, yet not till the Creator from his work desisting, though unwearied, up returned, up to the heaven of heavens, his, of, his high ab abode. Thence to behold this new created world, the addition of his empire, how it showed in prospect from his throne, how good, how fair, answering his great idea. Up he rode, followed with acclamation, and the sound symphonous of 10,000 harps that tune angelic harmonies, the earth, the air resounded. Thou rememberest, for thou heardst, the heavens and the constellations rung, the planets and their stations listening stood, while well, the bright pomp ascended jubilant. Now that you hear the music, the singing of the angels. So there's the heavens corresponding to the goodness of the earth. They are also exhibiting the same uh, music of harmony. Open ye everlasting gates, they sung. Open ye heavens, your living doors. Let in the great creator from his work return magnificent. His six days work a world open and henceforth oft, for God will deign to visit oft the dwellings of just men delighted, and with frequent intercourse thither will send his winged messengers on errands of supernal grace. So sung the glorious train ascending, he through heaven that opened wide her blazing portals led to God's eternal house directed the way. Um, and I'm thinking I'm going to think over this. I think I'm going to skip on here. Um, and then they keep the Sabbath uh, in, uh, on the seventh day 
And I'm going to skip over to book eight. Again, not for lack of desire to read it, but for wanting to actually get to book eight. I only got 20 minutes left here. You know what? I'll stop. 